Georgi Dobrovolsky, Viktor Patsayev, and Vladislav Volkov. On June 30, 1971, Georgi Dobrovolsky, Viktor Patsayev, and Vladislav Volkov were coming home as heroes after spending 23 days aboard Salyut 1, setting a new space endurance record. Everything seemed perfect during re entry. The automated systems functioned normally, the spacecraft was on course, and ground control tracked their descent. But when recovery teams opened the Soyuz capsule after its textbook landing, they found three cosmonauts sitting peacefully in their seats, looking like they had simply fallen asleep. Except they were dead. A ventilation valve had opened prematurely during re-entry, allowing their cabin atmosphere to escape into space. The crew had about 30 seconds to identify and fix the problem before losing consciousness, but the valve was located beneath their seats and required tools to access. They may have made things worse by accidentally opening additional valves while frantically trying to close the malfunctioning one. They died from asphyxiation as their spacecraft's atmosphere leaked into the vacuum of space. Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee January 27, 1967 was supposed to be a routine ground test, but it became NASA's darkest hour. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were sealed inside the Apollo 1 command module during a plugs-out test when an electrical fire erupted in the pure oxygen atmosphere of the cabin. In normal air, it would have been a manageable electrical fire. But in 100% oxygen, it became an instant inferno that consumed everything flammable in seconds. The astronauts had less than 30 seconds from the first sign of fire to complete loss of communication. Grissom's final transmission was, fire. We've got a fire in the cockpit, followed by screaming, then silence. The three men were trapped inside a spacecraft designed to protect them from space, but it became a death trap on Earth. The cabin was pressurized, and the complex hatch required over 90 seconds to open under ideal conditions. They died from carbon monoxide poisoning and cardiac arrest, caused by inhaling superheated gases. The cabin was so hot that their spacesuits melted and fused to the spacecraft walls. Actually welded everything together. Vladimir Komarov Vladimir Komarov knew he was probably going to die, and he flew anyway. The veteran Soviet cosmonaut was chosen to pilot Soyuz, one in April 1967, despite knowing the spacecraft had over 200 documented technical problems. According to some accounts, Komarov accepted the mission because he knew that if he refused, his backup pilot and close friend Yuri Gagarin would have to fly instead. From the moment Soyuz 1 reached orbit, everything went wrong. One solar panel failed to deploy leaving the spacecraft with limited power. The attitude control system malfunctioned, making it impossible to orient the spacecraft properly. Communication systems failed intermittently, and the automatic navigation system wasn't working. After 18 chaotic orbits, ground control ordered an immediate return. The descent began normally, but when the main parachute deployed, it failed to inflate properly due to a design flaw. The backup parachute then tangled with the main chute, creating a situation where neither could function. Komarov crashed into the ground at approximately 140 miles per hour, and the impact was so violent that his body was reportedly found as a charred, unrecognizable mass. He became the first human to die during a spaceflight mission. Some accounts suggest he spent his final moments cursing the engineers who had sent him up in a spacecraft they knew was defective. The Challenger 7 January 28, 1986, was supposed to be a celebration of space accessibility, but instead became one of the most traumatic moments in space history. The Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds after launch, killing all seven crew members in front of a live television audience. The crew, Francis Scobie, Michael Smith, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe represented the diversity and optimism of the space program. McAuliffe, in particular, had captured the nation's imagination as the first civilian teacher in space, planning to conduct lessons from orbit. 
The technical cause was an O-ring seal failure in one of the solid rocket boosters, caused by cold weather that made the rubber seals brittle. Engineers had warned against launching in cold weather, but their concerns were overruled by management, which was under pressure to maintain the launch schedule. The shuttle didn't explode as many believed. It broke apart due to aerodynamic forces after the structural failure of the external tank. The most horrifying aspect is that the crew cabin remained intact, and the astronauts may have survived the initial breakup, only to die when the cabin hit the ocean at over 200 miles per hour, after a two and a half minute fall from 46,000 feet. They were conscious and possibly trying to regain control during that terrifying plunge to their deaths. The Columbia 7, February 1st, 2003, was meant to end in celebration but instead became the second major shuttle disaster in NASA's history. Columbia disintegrated during re-entry over Texas, killing all seven crew members just 16 minutes before their scheduled landing. The crew, Rick Husband, William McCool, Michael Anderson, Kalpana Chawla, David Brown, Laurel Clark, and Elon Ramon, had completed a successful 16-day scientific mission. The disaster began 82 seconds after launch when a piece of foam insulation broke off the external fuel tank and struck Columbia's left wing at over 500 miles per hour. The impact created a hole in the wing's leading edge, compromising the thermal protection system. For 16 days, the crew had no idea their spacecraft was damaged. When Columbia began re-entry, superheated plasma entered the wing through the hole, melting the wing's internal structure. The shuttle began losing control as the damaged wing created asymmetric drag. The crew was unaware of the developing crisis until the final moments when they lost communication with mission control. Columbia broke apart over East Texas while traveling at over 12,000 miles per hour. The crew compartment was found months later, and evidence suggested the astronauts were conscious and trying to regain control even as the shuttle disintegrated around them. They were killed when the crew compartment hit the ground after falling from an altitude of over 40 miles. Michael J. Adams Michael J. Adams died on November 15, 1967, in one of the most spectacular and terrifying ways possible. His experimental aircraft broke apart around him while flying at the edge of space. Adams was a test pilot for the X-15 rocket plane program, pushing the boundaries of high-altitude flight in an aircraft that was essentially a manned missile. During his seventh X-15 flight, Adams was supposed to reach an altitude of 250,000 feet and conduct experiments in the near vacuum of space. The flight began normally, but as the X-15 climbed toward its target altitude, something went catastrophically wrong with the aircraft's attitude control system. The X-15 began an uncontrolled tumble at hypersonic speeds, while Adams fought desperately to regain control. The aircraft was spinning and tumbling so violently that Adams was subjected to forces that no human body could withstand. The X-15 then began breaking apart from the extreme aerodynamic stresses, essentially disintegrating around Adams while he was still conscious and trying to save the aircraft. The wreckage was scattered across 50 square miles of the Mojave Desert. Adams was posthumously awarded astronaut wings because his flight reached an altitude of 266,000 feet, technically qualifying as spaceflight. He died pushing the envelope of human flight, testing technology that would eventually make the space shuttle possible. Michael Alsbury Michael Alsbury's death on October 31, 2014, showed that even in the modern era of commercial spaceflight, space remains deadly. Alsbury was the co-pilot of Spaceship Two, Virgin Galactic's suborbital spacecraft designed to take paying passengers to the edge of space. During a test flight over the Mojave Desert, something went catastrophically wrong with Spaceship Two's feathering system, a mechanism designed to slow the aircraft during re-entry. The feathering system deployed prematurely while the aircraft was still accelerating, creating massive aerodynamic forces that tore the spacecraft apart. 
Alsbury was killed when the aircraft broke up around him, while pilot Peter Siebold somehow survived after being ejected from the disintegrating aircraft. The investigation revealed that Alsbury had unlocked the feathering system too early in the flight profile, though it shouldn't have been able to deploy without a command from the pilots. Alsbury's death was particularly tragic because he was part of the new generation of commercial space pilots who were supposed to make space accessible to ordinary people. Instead, his death served as a reminder that even routine-seeming space operations remain extraordinarily dangerous, and that the dream of safe commercial spaceflight still carries a deadly price. Charles Bassett and Elliot C. February 28, 1966, was supposed to be a routine training flight, but it became a double tragedy that claimed two NASA astronauts in one of the most preventable accidents in space program history. Charles Bassett and Elliot C. were flying a T-38 jet to St. Louis to practice spacecraft procedures when bad weather turned their flight into a death trap. As they approached Lambert Field in heavy cloud cover and freezing rain, their T-38 crashed into the roof of Building 101 at McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, ironically, the same building where their Gemini spacecraft was being manufactured. Both astronauts were killed instantly in the crash. The accident was entirely preventable. Weather conditions were below minimums for the approach they were attempting, and they should have diverted to an alternate airport. Instead, they pressed on with a dangerous approach in conditions that would challenge even experienced commercial pilots. Their deaths led to stricter weather minimums for NASA flights and mandatory instrument training for all astronauts. They were replaced on the Gemini 9 mission by their backup crew, but their deaths served as a reminder that the journey to space often begins with dangerous training flights that can claim lives long before launch day. Valentin Bondarenko Valentin Bondarenko died in a fire during ground training on March 23, 1961, just weeks before Yuri Gagarin's historic first flight. The Soviets kept his death secret for decades, fearing it would damage their space program's reputation and reveal weaknesses in their training procedures. Bondarenko was participating in a 10-day isolation test in a pressure chamber filled with pure oxygen. On the final day of the test, he removed medical sensors from his body and cleaned the adhesive spots with alcohol-soaked cotton. He carelessly tossed the cotton aside, and it landed on a hot plate used for heating food. In the pure oxygen environment, the alcohol-soaked cotton ignited instantly, creating a flash fire that engulfed the chamber in seconds. The fire burned so intensely that it took ground crew several minutes to depressurize the chamber and open the hatch. By then, Bondarenko had suffered burns over 90% of his body. He remained conscious and even tried to help the rescue team apologizing for his carelessness as they pulled him from the chamber. Bondarenko died eight hours later from his injuries, becoming the first space program fatality. His death led to changes in Soviet training procedures, but the secrecy surrounding the accident meant that NASA wasn't warned about the dangers of pure oxygen environments. Six years later, the same type of fire would kill the Apollo 1 crew, Clifton Williams. Clifton Williams died on October 5, 1967 in a T-38 crash that robbed NASA of one of its most promising astronauts. Williams was performing aerobatic maneuvers near Tallahassee, Florida, when his aircraft's controls apparently malfunctioned, sending the T-38 into an unrecoverable dive. Williams attempted to eject from the aircraft, but he was too low for his parachute to deploy properly. He was killed on impact just seconds after ejecting from his aircraft. The crash was witnessed by other pilots, who described watching helplessly as Williams fought to regain control of his aircraft before making the desperate decision to eject. Williams was assigned to the backup crew for Apollo 9, and would likely have been assigned to a lunar landing mission if he had lived. His death was particularly tragic because he was known as one of the most skilled pilots in the astronaut course someone who could handle any aircraft in any situation. 
The irony of William's death wasn't lost on his fellow astronauts. A man trained to survive the ultimate hostile environment of space was killed by a mechanical failure in a routine training aircraft. His death contributed to growing concerns about the T-38 fleet and led to improved maintenance procedures. But it came too late to save a pilot who should have walked on the moon, Robert H. Lawrence Jr. Robert H. Lawrence Jr.'s death on December 8, 1967, robbed America of its first African-American astronaut and a brilliant scientist pilot who could have commanded the space shuttle. Lawrence was killed in an F-104 Starfighter crash at Edwards Air Force Base while serving as an instructor pilot, teaching another aviator the steep descent glide technique that would later become critical for space shuttle landings. Selected for the Air Force's Manned Orbiting Laboratory program just six months earlier, at 32, he was already one of the most qualified astronauts ever chosen. A senior Air Force pilot with over 2,500 flight hours and a doctorate in physical chemistry from Ohio State University. Few astronauts at that time held a doctorate. The crash occurred during what should have been a routine training flight. Lawrence was in the back seat of the F-104 as Major Harvey Royer practiced the challenging flare maneuver, pulling the aircraft's nose up just before touchdown to reduce landing speed. Royer flared too late, and the aircraft struck the ground hard, causing the landing gear to fail and the plane to catch fire and roll. Both men ejected, but the timing sequence meant Lawrence's rear seat ejected sideways to avoid hitting the front occupant. He was killed instantly, still strapped to his ejector seat when his parachute failed to deploy properly. The aircraft skidded 2,000 feet down the runway while Lawrence was dragged 75 feet from the wreckage. These astronauts and cosmonauts represent the most visible and heartbreaking examples of space exploration's cost. Every loss reshaped the future. Each disaster forced hard lessons spurred innovation, and led to life-saving improvements in spacecraft design, training, and mission planning. Their sacrifices were not in vain. They pushed the boundaries of what humanity can achieve. They died not just in pursuit of the unknown, but in service of progress. And because of them, the path to space is safer, stronger, and open to those who dream of reaching beyond the sky.